to the fourth of now what's going to be five uh, lectures on uh, Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish. Um, okay, this lecture is going to focus entirely on part three disciplines. I think we'll get through for certain docile bodies and the means of correct training. And then I may stop at panopticism. I may at least foreshadow a little bit of it. Then we'll come back for one final lecture uh, that sort of wraps up the book with panopticism. And then I'll just skim it and, and hardly mention uh, complete and austere institutions and illegality and delinquency. And instead, we'll jump right to the carceral, All right? So, um, yeah, so panopticism and the carceral in one final uh, lecture. All right. But before that, uh, we're going to cover uh, the section on uh, discipline. So docile bodies and so on. Okay, so let's just really quickly remind ourselves what Foucault is doing. So uh, Foucault is tracing, um, he's trying to make sense of modern um, disciplinary society, right? Let's just sort of get right there. Okay. So this is what he thinks we're living in right now, something like disciplinary society. And in order for us to sort of comprehend what that is and to understand genetically how it came about, he began by having us understand the logic of punishment and the logic of power in traditional societies, especially the monarchical societies of Europe. So uh, the scaffold was the physical stage upon which the theater of punishment and the theater of power was enacted. It was the torture of the condemned body that created terror um, and, and a kind of traumatic response among the spectators, and that made the power of the sovereign visible. So remember, uh, I, I will, we'll just use this um, old uh, illuminated manuscript um, that, again, it is the body of the condemned that is being uh, tortured and dismembered. Um, it is the, this is the king. It, the king is not the one who's actually killing. Uh, the tool of the executioner is doing the killing. But the king's majesty and power and symbolic um, um, uh, uh, might is um, made real to spectators as they observe the uh, scaffold upon which the um, condemned person is being uh, killed. So, so there's just a few military people here, but again, imagine, this is just a miniature, but imagine, again, you know, thousands of people and that this is an elevated scaffold and that you're seeing this theatrical litur liturgy of power uh, playing out. Okay, so Foucault argues that somewhere or another we, we went through a period um, uh, during sort of the Enlightenment and uh, um, the era of the Protestant Reformation and some of the sort of um, more Calvinist, say, you know, Jansenist um, um, Catholic uh, responses to the Reformation. And uh, we had uh, that the horrors and, um, that were enacted upon the body of the condemned, rejected, and instead a new focus upon gentle um, reform working upon the soul and representations made to the soul of the uh, offender so that the offender is um, is um, visibly present before um, the social body so we're now living in a world of a kind of civil society of juridical law um, uh, a world of bourgeois contract right it's a kind of bourgeois civil society and the bourgeois civil society observes offenders and the penalties that they pay. The crimes that they've committed are symbolically and even semiotically linked to the penalty that they're paying. The crime and the penalty are linked. And the penalty is more uh, displeasurable than the um, crime was pleasurable. And that, that linkage then spreads throughout uh, the social body, legitimating the system of power and uh, creating general deterrence and a kind of legitimation for the law and the legal system and the bourgeois order. Okay, so there's there's a punitive city then where the um, where there would be a non horrific but yet conspicuous presence of penalty paying criminals who would provide examples on an everyday basis 
to children and adults, affirming the justice and um, inevit inevitability and inexorability of the law. Okay, and what we have found is is that that does not happen. That this is just a vanishing mediator. It legitimated the elimination of horror and terror and torture, but that one of the um, sort of side institutions that was associated with reform was the prison and the prison then uh, which shouldn't have been come become the central agent of social control nevertheless did so we never arrived at the punitive city but in the process of eliminating the scaffold we wind up at the prison and so that's what this last section of the book is about is is about the prison as the kind of meta institution a kind of metastasizing institution that spreads everywhere in uh, contemporary society. Everywhere capitalism goes, so too goes prisons. And that the logic, the internal logic of the prison discipline winds up um, being echoed or mirrored in all of the other um, institutions that are everywhere else in, um, in, in the society. So under capitalism, let's get to the last sentence of this section. Um, and Foucault writes, is it surprising that prisons resemble factories, schools, military barracks, hospitals, and that which all resemble prisons, okay? That there's a kind of um, uh, isomorphism, similarity in form, similarity in function even, of all of these major institutions of power. Factories, offices, schools, uh, prisons, military barracks, hospitals. Those are the ones that he keeps listing over and over again. So the argument is being made here that something happens under capitalism where the prison and the kind of internal organization of prisons, the functioning of discipline within prisons, becomes a kind of model or a refinement of practices that are already existent out in capitalist modernity, right? And that understanding the prison isn't just a mechanism to understand prisoners or to understand what happens to uh, uh, a crime and so on. It's a um, sort of a, a skeleton key really to understanding how power operates in capital, okay? And so it's, um, so as we're going to find, he's going to make the argument that, that instead of operating on the soul, we're working on the body, again, directly on the body. So if traditional society... Um, contained social or, or, or ignited social control or realized social control by tearing apart the body that condemned, torturing the body that condemned, and so on. Uh, contemporary society uh, incarcerates the body of the of of the offender, right, and then coerces them into a regime of discipline. So that this is not a an operation that works through the soul. It isn't an operation that's aimed at returning. Um, or restoring a member of civil society back into the world of self-regulating, autonomous, contract-forming, uh, bourgeois uh, citizens. Instead, it's a process that's much more aimed at direct control, direct co coercion, direct um, you know, bodily um, uh, containment, so that the person who works through the prison system, through the school system, through the factory system, and so on, winds up fit for wage labor within the capitalist order. And if you don't fit within that capitalist order, then by God, you're placed inside of a reform, <laughs> reformatory or a prison uh, or a workhouse or a school again, which has the same structure as the prison, um, and we get you reformulated again. And once you are you know, able to be obedient and docile and disciplined there, then we can release you back out back into the prison of the office, the prison of the school, and the prison of the factory. Okay, so it, it's, it's, it, so it really is a story. We begin on the body in traditional society. There was a moment when we thought we would work on the soul and reform people, which really wound up not happening, and instead we wind up in disciplinary society. We began with a scaffold as the theatrics of power, we evolved by, in reformers a world into the punitive city where there would be a kind of garden, a theatrical garden of, dis, of, of punitive delights where you'd be able to see 
um, this semiotic link between crime and punishment being played out to educate and to legitimate um, uh, the system to children and adults. That goes away. That never happens. And instead, we wind up with the prison as this new stage, this new sort of, um, uh, again, um, um, architecture, technology of, of the application of the power um, inherent within a capitalist society, the way that it, it embodied and the way that it, it reconstructs uh, the subjects within it. Okay, so yes, yeah. so the crucial thing that, that Foucault says is that um, both the scaffold of traditional society and the theatrical stages of the punitive city, these scenes of public works by offenders, that both of those orders depended upon visibility, the visibility of um, here of the scaffold and the uh, majesty of the king being represented on the scaffold. Here is the visibility of the punishment of the crime that, that, that has to be. So, so in other words, the, the criminal being viewed, the offender being viewed, the punishment being seen was important both in the traditional and in this classical reform world. So seeing the um, uh, uh, majesty of the king here in the traditional world and then seeing uh, the logic and reason of the society of laws of civil society being, being enacted in these theaters of punishment, right, is crucial to the classical era. What we're going to find is, is that in the prison era and the disciplinary society of our time, um, the direction of power inverts. So that um, power is something that is it, the, the, the ability to see, right? Um, seeing. Seeing is the essence of power in our world. And being seen or revealing, right, um, was the essence of power in both the traditional society and in the models of the classical reformers. So this gets inverted. The power of the gaze gets inverted so that those who see, those who are able to observe, to supervise, to survey, in the French term, right, who are able, who are the agents of surveillance, that's power. So it, it really is like, like spies and, and intelligence gathering, uh, physicians gathering a file, um, uh, a case being uh, put together, uh, you know, by police, or a file being created for every student in every school everywhere, that the ability to see is where power lies. So the subject of power is the person who is seen by power. Here, in the traditional world, the subject of power is the person who sees power being made manifest in torture. In the classical world, the subject of power is the person who sees the crime and punishment semiotically linked together in a theater of punishment, and therefore I, uh, the subject of power, are those who legitimate and comprehend and um, affirm the, um, again, the, the, the sort of codified uh, juridical uh, system of civil society. So seeing, seeing are both the um, uh, ways uh, of the subject of power in these worlds, being seen is the way of the subject of power in disciplinary society. Seeing is power in disciplinary society. Being seen is power in traditional society and, oddly enough, in, um, in the punitive city as well. Okay? So you get this inversion of optics. All right. We get that. Okay. So I think that that's enough to get us started here. So... Again, um, yeah, I, I think I think we can get going with that. So um, let's see images. Um, last time, then we we looked at at the way in which traditional logics of terror, torture, physical punishment, pain, and the exhibition of pain was not just a technique of punishment in the criminal justice system, and it but but it was a logic of power everywhere in religion, in schools, and in work. And I want to do the same thing now. So the classical reformers, probably the most uh, fully, um, I, you know, I, I'm just going to embrace the Quakers. The Quakers 
are the people who I'm going to make the claim. Uh, you know, they certainly were on behind the Pen Pennsylvania system. Um, but the Quakers are really all about the soul. Um, you know, the inner light, I've talked about it already, the religion of, of, um, of quietude, right? So, so the way that a Quaker religious service works out, it's actually a meeting, a Quaker meeting, a friends meeting, where you come together and you get quiet around each other. So calm, quiet co-presence with others. That's the essence of the religious experience. Um, you don't have uh, a hierarchy. Men and women are often separated to keep the, uh, the sensuality at a very low volume. But there really isn't a kind of hierarchy of men and women. These are very egalitarian institutions. People of different races, um, different backgrounds. Um, technically, you know, a different, different social classes even are here. You know, ex-slaves or even slaves, uh, Native Americans and so on, Africans. Um, and so it's, an, it's a very egalitarian world. And, and the essence of the religious service, again, isn't to come into a setting where someone harangues you or, or, uh, or something like that from a position of power. Instead, people are quiet. They're inward, right? Mindful, I guess, would be the word that we would use today. And that uh, anyone can speak if the Spirit so moves them. So, and sometimes, uh, again, a good meeting, no one would speak, right? People would just come together and be in each other's co-presence, unburdened, quiet, peaceful, communing with the inner light, uh, the conscience and the soul uh, um, meeting uh, the inner light of God, and then being in the co-presence of other people doing the same thing. So quietude, isolation, order, classification. I just want you to look at this. This is what a Quaker meet. These are free people. This isn't, um, you know, if you go to a Quaker meeting today, they still look a lot like this, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's orderly, uh, but it's a kind of spontaneous order. There's classification going on, but it really isn't particularly hierarchical. It's, it's, um, but, but it's inward, it's calm, it's quiet. So the idea is, is that if you're burdened, if you're excited, if you're going through trauma, something like that, these meeting places are peace, calm, and so on, so that, again, you can uh, reason return to its throne, the soul can reunite uh, with the oversoul, something like that. Well, here's an image of a Puritan slash Quaker workhouse um, actually I actually think this is English, but, but it's a, uh, uh, so it's quietism and calm co-presence. So these are work, women in a workhouse, um, who, you know, who can't sustain, uh, again, in, in capitalism without a decent social welfare system in the 19th century, people who lacked paid employment, couldn't survive on the outside. And so they would find themselves in workhouses segregated by gender. So there's women, here's men. So it looks an awful lot like a Quaker religious service. Quiet, you're being unburdened, so you're being fed, you're kept somewhat warm, you're provided with clothing, right? And that kind of thing. The basic needs of light, light, right? Um, relatively decent company, but, but, but again, quietude, right? Quietude, quiet co-presence, um, orderly, classified, and so on. Okay, so this is a workhouse, and it probably looks really austere, and it is austere. But you know, the Quaker meeting, even of those who were really wealthy Quakers, was very austere, and intentionally so. Okay, it really wasn't about the display and conspicuous consumption of goods and services. It really is about again getting quiet, becoming unburdened, right, so that you and your soul uh, can can uh, come together. So people who come to the workhouse come there as a kind of refuge from a world of trauma. Uh, and, and even though it's brutal in many ways, um, it nevertheless is less brutal than the out, outer world. In other words, I, I kind of have a soft spot for Quaker reformers. I think that they often really intended uh, to, do, to do good. Well, here's, here's the uh, Pennsylvania uh, prison. This is the, Pencil, the famous Pen, um, Eastern State Penitentiary, uh, known as Cherry Hill State Prison. Um, this is the one that, um, that, that Foucault writes about. So it's very famous because it instituted, as you see here, the Pennsylvania system of prison discipline, the separate system, uh, right? And that's to be distinguished from the congregate system. So in the separate system, solitary, not solitary confinement as a punishment, but separation as a therapeutic or separation as a reform move uh, was, uh, was included along with some other features, you know, like, like, like work and, and those kinds of things. 
Um, you can see that it has a kind of panoptic structure to it. More on that later, a central guard tower, a bunch of, 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 um, of um, radiating uh, cell blocks, all ordered and organized. Um, everybody's in their place. It's easy to see those who are out of place. The different blocks are ordered with, um, you know, are classified so that as you are moving up and down the privilege system and, uh, you know, the point system, um, you're 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 uh, you're being moved around so there's a classification going on and a progression through um i actually think that goffin does a better job of this than foucault in many ways here's another image of a quaker meeting again so i just want you to note the the way that the that the quaker women here uh are are, are wearing hoods essentially right um um bonnets that basically blind them to much of the activity outside it, it, it is a kind of it's it's like putting blinders on a horse right it's a or or, or in goffman's uh, asylums he writes about you know uh, people who are surrounded by um, other inmates in a mental ward will sometimes cover themselves with a blanket to provide themselves with solitude right with a kind of separation from those around well these quaker costumes often provided a kind of they're a uniform we'll start with that i mean even though you're not really required like to wear the same clothes but there was a very narrowness of style again you're not trying to be ostentatious or stand out from anyone you're actually fitting in and and not doing so ostentatiously so the clothing of the men and the women it, it's kind of uniform and it's it's not showy it's very functional and it tends to foster something like separation. So again, the soul, the inner life, quiet co-presence with others, that's the Quaker way, right? And not just for those in prison, but for those outside. Okay, so here's some images of a Quaker-inspired um, uh, separate system. I think these mostly come from Pentonville Prison um, in Britain. But but uh, again, you'll see this is, this is a Sunday, I believe, um, uh, sermon or the Sunday religious service. Um, this is the one time where the uh, agent of power is being seen as well as seeing, right? And all of the inmates are in their little separate, you know, cells, their little observation stations, where they are uh, kept free of excitation of the body and of other people, and where their minds and are able to be focused, again, if not on the inner light of God, on the um, presence and words and uh, of, of the ref of the uh, you know minister or, or reformer who's speaking here you know but you just turn this around so so here this is a moment when uh the person on the platform of power is being seen but just imagine again a kind of bl a black uh smoked glass screen here and the same structure would work where all of the these um uh inmates in pentonville are all visible and can be easily monitored by very efficiently by one man who can see very clearly into every one of these cells it has what a hundred people under his direct gaze and can easily identify those who are not conforming to the way or in the wrong place at the wrong time all right so here's here's another it's the treadmill again i can't from holloway prison again in britain um prison reformers were often very much linked to uh they 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 were the sort of um uh, the nonconformist religious uh, groups, Quakers, uh, Methodists, um, um, you know, um, you know, in America linked to some of the other religious denominations as well. But it, but it was really the nonconformists are the ones who really were pushing uh, uh, prison reform, you know, proto-capitalists in many ways. Right. And so, again, is there any wonder, as Foucault says, that the inner workings of a prison and the inner workings of a factory are the same, that they begin to resemble each other. So here is the the treadwheel and oakum shed. So oakum is, um, you know, fiber taken from a tree, I believe. I don't, I'm not sure even how it's done, but it's it's made into a kind of fiber that's used to chink the, um, the gaps in a wooden uh, uh, naval vessel, right? You mix it with tar and so on. So very important material and kind of tedious to make. And so it's the kind of work that is is um again it's difficult but it's kind of repetitive it doesn't require an immense amount of, of concentration 
But you can see here that the workstations, the men who are working are sitting in these little individuated stalls, a little bit like contemporary cubicles and almost any suburban, um, um, you know, corporate uh, headquarters or something, right? Where you're working in a, in a cubicle separated from other people. Um, still, but, 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 but open enough where you're subject to surveillance of, the, um, of a guard or a supervisor, as well as subject to the kind of uh, uh, surveillance of those around you, right? You would stand out if you did something. So, so you're working in a kind of solitary confinement. So it actually looks a lot here like the Quaker Religious Service, right? So here's the Quaker Religious Service. And here is the uh, Quaker-inspired uh, reformed prison with the separate system. So the workers, you're working as much as you can during the day. There's a treadmill back here to get big muscle uh, work going. Um, there are even mechanisms to open up blades on a fan to control the amount of energy or effort needed to be expended in order to run the treadmill. So you'd run that treadmill for a while, not as a workout over at a, a gym that you're paying money for, but you're doing it as a kind of, um, as, a, as a discipline, as exercise, as we're going to talk about exercise here. Okay, so you're being productive and you're doing it not but under the lash, not under the whip, not for fear of having of being tortured or beaten. You're doing it um, almost as a kind of meditation, right? As a, as a, you know, the old, um, you know, Benedictine motto, ora et labora, right? Work through prayer. There's a bit of that here, right? Even though it's not Catholic, it's 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 that idea that there's a kind of um, that occupying the hands of being productive and redeeming time, to use the the Quaker and um, um, uh, phrase redeeming time is 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 good it's godly right and it puts you in the mindset it removes your burdens for one thing you're not burdened with your own excited thoughts and so on if you're meditatively uh, doing work like this okay here's another image from the separate system this is a penton uh pentridge um the silent system so the wearing of hoods and so on it d uh, again it's like a uniform not just for the body but for the face and it's a way to keep you separate. So even when you're doing exercise in the yard, this is a very famous image. It's just a one of those images that's just sort of horrifying. But 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 again, you're 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 doing your exercise more on the exercise um, by walking around the yard. In you know you're holding the ropes. You're not moving independently. You're not quite in lockstep as we're going to get to uh, next time. But 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 you're walking uh, non-independently. And, but, but you're doing so in solitary, right? You're not talking to other people. The face of other people isn't there. You don't have a ritual status. They don't have a ritual status. You can't really have an interaction, a ritual in Goffman's terms. You can't really establish face, defend face, or anything like that. You literally are without face, barefaced, shameless, really, okay? Because it can't happen here. All right. So that's the separate system. So that would be a kind of transformation of those ideas of the reformers that, that that were only partly instituted. And what you wound up with is that these ideas of the reformers, instead of it leading to a full punitive uh, city in the way that they imagined, it wound up leading to prisons that had a very kind of unique structure. And that the legitimations of the prison reformers, these Enlightenment and Protestant Reformation thinkers, wound up providing... Um, a kind of rough draft for, you know, Bentham and um, Beccaria's um, um, notions of, of uh, prison and panopticon. All right, so as we go. All right, so, um, so it, it, this section opens with um, uh, a contemplation of, of military discipline. And I had one more photo for you or image for you, which obviously whenever I want to show you something, I wind up not having it. I'm setting it aside somewhere. Here it is. Um, yeah, it's going to be for next time, but uh, we'll, we'll do it now. This is Robert Miner's famous World War I uh, uh, drawing, and it's called, it's the Army, Army Medical Examiner, 1916, At Last a Perfect Soldier, right? And it's a kind of a critique of, of um, you know, the of, of military training and a, a kind of desire for um, on the political right, at least, for people to be completely thoughtless. This is kind of like the Prussian model of, of, of military discipline. No thought, no reason, no hesitation, 
in immediate execution, right? There, that all that a soldier is, is a being that executes the orders that they receive, right? So that planning and execution wind up separated out and that you don't hesitate, right? You don't think, you just do. So thoughtless, uh, reflectionless action, right? But with a body that's very disciplined, very trained, very hard, very effective, and that has been meticulously controlled and meticulously, again, trained, um, in movement and in coordinated action with other soldiers who are similarly built, right? No head, no thought, no reflection, no resistance, right? Just um, um, a kind of, you know, uh, immediate conformity and execution of orders, that kind of thing. All right, so... Um, uh, so that's it. And, and, and uh, I'll, I'll just mention it now. But I, I wrote a little piece with uh, Mark Worrell, uh, got a decade ago now, um, in, uh, in the online journal Fast Capitalism, recommend it to you, um, about uh, a variety of things in there. James Bond was in it, and Avatar, the film Avatar. And the uh, AMPs, the, um, I can't remember what, the, what AMP stands for anymore, but the, the, the m machine that wraps around the soldier uh, in that film looks just like Robert Miner's Perfect Soldier, right? The being that has no head, all musculature, all arms, right? That executes um, uh, um, orders uh, without actually sort of, you know, thinking them through and resisting and that kind of thing. Okay. All right. So, so um, Foucault opens uh, part three on discipline then with a section on docile bodies, all right? So to be docile is to be... Um, not quite passive, but at least to be um, pliable, open to reconstruction, right? Uh, you take orders, you listen, um, and you can be formed, you can be molded. To be docile is to be moldable, to be shapeable, that kind of thing. And by the way, I just want to mention something here, that, that Foucault's work, you know, it, it, it's very close to Weber's writings on bureaucracy in some ways. In fact, Weber's more powerful in many ways, right? So Foucault's concept of disciplinary society and panopticism is close to Weber, but it, again, has kind of a different shading. But the comparison between the two is very powerful. Uh, it's very close to um, uh, to Harry Braverman, uh, Labor and Monopoly Capital, which I have sitting here. Um, uh, the Degradation of Work in the 20th Century, 1974 book. So it's only a couple years older than um, than Foucault's book, but this is almost unread today, right? It's a book about uh, scientific management and worker discipline inside, and it, you know, really, honestly, the disciplinary society inside of the capitalist workplace in a mid 20th century. So incredibly relevant to Foucault. Again, it, it, it's almost not read anymore, um, even though I think it's every bit as powerful. Um, and again, it's really about the way that these practices work out in, in capitalist workplaces, especially factories. Um, and then I just want to point to, uh, at some point I'll do a recording on, on Tavalite's Male Fantasies, uh, this massive two-volume uh, work from uh, the mid-1970s again, uh, late 1970s, um, about again, about the time of Foucault, um, and he really writes about the institutions that uh, surround the figure of the soldierly male, right? And so it's all about discipline and military discipline and the structure of society, the structure of religion, the structure of family, the structure of gender um, in the years leading up to World War I, after World War I, into the proto-Nazi and Nazi period, right? And so, again, uh, incredibly good critical uh, theory. Um, again, it, it's not nearly as widely read as Foucault, but in some ways more powerful. It just needs a little, um, you know, it's, it's longer and so on. But at any rate, so so Foucault, um, ag again, a lot like or like Irving Goffman. Goffman's originality shrinks when you uh, reinsert him back into the field of thought in which he's writing. Um, Foucault's a very original thinker. I don't want to ever take that away from him. He's incredibly creative, very original. But um, I, I think some of these other writers with their comparative notions, like, again, uh, uh, Braverman's, um, you know, uh, scientific management in, on, in, in the separation of, of execution and planning uh, within uh, workplaces and so on, Tavolite, Socially Mail, and Weber's Bureaucracy, all powerful. Okay, so uh, so one, page 135, back to discipline and punish, page 135. Um, Foucault writes about soldierly drilling 
um, discipline and training of, of a soldierly kind and about the origins of what we now think of as kind of like boot camp and, and, and the, um, the kind of, you know, what Goffin wrote about is a, the kind of mortification itself and then uh, disciplined uh, reconstruction afterwards. But page 136 is a new docility, uh, again, moldableness, shapeableness, right? That you're finished in, in, in formation with others that operates on, uh, on the individual body, uh, exercise, training. The body um, is uh, that there's an uninterrupted, constant coercion, uh, supervising, um, um, yeah, process of activity. So, so you're constantly being coerced, supervised, and there's someone intervening in the natural flow of bodily movement. So, so you're not just acting in accordance to drives. You're not a being realizing drives. There's something that's constantly, perpetually interrupting drives. And so you become a, a being that is being shaped, being formed, being reconstructed, right? Docility um, in accordance with some scheme, some coercive scheme. So this is codification and regimentation of movement, the disciplines, he calls it, as a general formula for domination. So we know about the academic disciplines. They really are disciplines. So what does it mean to be disciplined, right? It's, it really is about, um, you know, uh, sticking to something along um, a pre-planned, um, um, you know, mapped out, uh, codified, regimented, uh, uh, um, you know, process of thought and action. More about that as we go, right? So the academic disciplines are disciplines, but I think he really means those here that directly touch the body and interact with the body in relations of power. So it's going to be pedagogy and schooling and so on. More of that as we go, right? So the disciplines. So he thinks it's not slavery or service, just control of body motion that really becomes a new growth industry, basically, in the modern world. So while servile labor in Europe is beginning to be washed away, uh, slavery and servile labor here in America begins to get washed away by the mid-19th century, there's some kind of new form of docility that escapes these categories that grows nevertheless, right? Okay, page 138. Uh, the coercions, uh, techniques of movement, yeah. Um, the body is subjected and, uh, uh, yeah, practiced. Um, there's a new political anatomy of direct control over bodies in various institutions. So here they are. So education, hospitals, including mental hospitals, really the military, especially the military barracks and training, and then the capitalist workshop. But those are the four sites, the four places that have a new political anatomy. That means a new sort of, um, um, you know, fiber really linking together the um, power, the source of power, and the um, object of power, right? The object and the subject of power. So page 139, um, this new form of discipline or power is meticulous. It uses minute techniques. It's kind of a new microphysics of power, he calls it. I should quote on page 139. Um, I'll take my own advice here and do it. Um, yeah, so page 139, yeah. So, yeah, the microphysics of power here... Um, they define a certain mode of detailed political investment of the body. Small acts of cunning endowed with a great power of diffusion. Subtle arrangements, apparently innocent but profoundly suspicious. Mechanisms that obeyed economies too shameful to be acknowledged. They um, or pursued petty forms of coercion. They that brought about the mutation of the punitive system at the threshold. So it's a, it takes on the coherence of a tactic, the acts of cunning, not the greater reason that works in its sleep and gives meaning uh, it's the attentive malevolence that turns everything to account. Discipline is a political anatomy of detail. So this isn't, as he keeps talking about, like, like he, he disembodies power in our time. So he, he's, it, and I think he's wrong about that. I think it needs to be specified who it is that exercises that power. Now he keeps going back again to these four locations, education, hospitals, military, workshops. But I think if you actually unpack that, to me, he'd have done so much better, you know, to just say capitalist, 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 capitalist. Again, the only thing I'll grant him um, is that in the mid-20th century, communism was a widespread system. Uh, we really had the first world of capitalism, the second world under the, you know, the communist Soviet regimes of, of, of uh, you know, of Russia, China, 
uh, and so on. So, so the world wasn't all capitalist. And I think he was trying to claim correctly that these same disciplinary processes exist where capitalism takes the different form of state capitalism, whatever it was under, under communism. So, so I'll give him that, but it, to me, the book would be much more useful in our day if he was focused in on, on capitalism as the unifying subject that lies behind all of these uh, institutions. Okay, page 139. There's a meticulous uh, minute technique. We already talked about that. Page 140. Again, he keeps using the same terms. It's meticulous, fussy. There's inspections. There's supervision of every detail. This happens in school under the logic of pedagogy. It happens in hospitals under the logic of medicine. It happens in military basics under the logic of military um, uh, you know, strategy or something, military science. And it happens in economic production facilities, workshops, uh, using the logic of sort of managerial science, right? Okay, page 141. What does this new discipline look like, the docile body disciplinary uh, system? Well, number one, it, it focuses upon an art of distribution of individuals in space. So first of all, it's all about space. So as we're going to see when it gets later on, that that masses, undifferentiated masses of people are dangerous to crowd the mass um, in 19th century sociology, definitely. And so you want to take a mass and you want to part partition it you want to separate it you want to classify it you know if you watched i hate to talk about this in this way but if you look at what um, many of the um, um, counter protest actions of police were this summer is to take a large group of people who are protesting and the way they control them is to begin to parse them up right to uh, separate them, to segregate them, to classify them, right? And then to begin to dominate them uh, from that point. So, so it's the art of distribution of individuals in space. And here the whole point is to make it difficult for there to be a kind of um, spontaneous eruption of uncontrolled power in a mass. Instead, human energy is going to be disciplined, distributed in space for maximum power for someone else, okay? So it isn't going to be the power of the mass, the power of the people. The people are going to be separated, distributed in space so that their energy is going to empower something else, right? Okay, so so number one, this takes place with an enclosure, so space is enclosed. Um, space that is normalized, intensified, yeah. So the reason why you enclose people in space is that you then allow for the normalization within that space, the intensification of discipline within that space, and then you can uh, you know, control access in and out and so on. So the factory is a good model of this, the prison, uh, the hospital, the school, the barracks, and so on. Number two, you partition the space inside analytical space, he calls it. Probably the core notion here is the cell, the workspace, the uh, office space, the cubicle, um, the desk at an uh, at a school, um, you know, where, but, but, but your part, you know, the barracks, you probably got a cot or something like that, right? But where you're divided up into different um, cells, right? Okay, and then there's a particularism of functional differentiation or specialization. So you're distributing bodies into these cells and closing them in this space, but it's not just done randomly, that, that they're, you're being placed in a very specific location in accordance with functional duty and in accordance with some knowledge that is known about you as your place there, right? So you're distributing bodies, isolating them, and mapping them so that you wind up with... Um, yeah, yeah, just just like as Braverman says in his 1974 book on on work within capitalist industry. Okay, page 195. Um, do I really jump to that? I've got the wrong page here. 145. I seem too early. Um, okay, the fourth trait: rank of position. There is a um, social ordering. I'm not sure I got that right. I think I do. Yeah, there is a social ordering. A ranking, a classification that goes on. So it isn't just differentiation, it's ranking as well, right? So um, for so some examples of that, the use of the term class and education, um, class, first class, second class, that kind of thing, right? But you're classified, that's what a class is. So you're in the sophomore class, it's a classification. It really isn't age, it's really more about competency and completion. And, and you can be demoted and promoted and so on, held back or, or, or skip, right? So classification in that sense. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and then discipline and supervision then 
is aimed at and um, often um, um, facilitated by having something like a homogenous class. There's rank uh, with promotion and, and demotion and so on in the military. Um, yeah, constant classification and ranking of orders. Page 148. Uh, the disciplines use architecture to arrange in a kind of grid way a hierarchy of classified docile bodies. You distribute bodies, separate them, divide them into space, and so on. So it's a systematic classification of the architecture. So every school has that kindergarten, first, second, third grade, right on up. Um, uh, there's a lot of classification that goes on in the military in that way, even separating officers from enlisted and so on. Um, so, so yeah, and then certainly within prisons, within uh, uh, asylums with back wards and front wards with more or less privilege based upon the functioning of the uh, normal inmate within them. Okay, so there's a spatial then ordering of facilities, minute supervision and control. Okay, so then it goes into the section. Uh, okay, so now we've talked about one of the main features then of this new disciplinary society is the organization of space. Now he's going to say the second main feature is the organization of time, activities. This is done with timetables, rhythms, um, occupations, cycles of activity, and so on, the mo mo monastery being the original form of that. But temporal control now is part of everything, a timetable in schools, in, in hospitals, in um, prisons, obviously, in, in workplaces. Uh, two, temporal elaboration of acts. So there's kind of meticulous, precise breakdown of actions that are now programmed and prescribed. So, you know, you don't just say do X, Y, and Z, but there's been time motion studies that have broken things down so that your movements in time are carefully coordinated and, and, and programmed. You can see this a lot, like in military parades, when um, there are things like, you know, uh, movements of rifles from shoulder to shoulder or presenting arms or something. It's done in a very elaborate way, but the steps have been broken down. And then the, 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 the disciplined uh, soldier just acts according uh, to that elaborated uh, act. Number three, there's a co coordination of the body and the gesture. So again, time motion uh, studies, efficiency studies, that the body is, the whole body is controlled in uh, it, to, to accomplish some gestures. So it isn't just uh, movement of a tool, it's often the placement of the whole body. It isn't just um, the way that one goes about, uh, again, manipulating a bolt or a tool. It really is a kind of total ergonomic control of the body. Uh, number four, body and object articulation. Again, the same kind of thing, meticulous meshing, basically, of the body and tools that it uses. The body becomes a part of a precise maneuver um, by um, in, in the tool. It's kind of a unity there. And then five, um, there's an exhaustive use of time. You eliminate waste, idleness, um, uh, downtime by creating a meticulous uh, sequence uh, uh, and uh, or sequence of activity, breaking it down, um, and then filling time up as much as possible, being efficient. So see description of um, raising the gun to the shoulder that's in the book about uh, whatever page this is at here. So the, my major criticism, again, Foucault has no comprehension of an underlife. There isn't one here. The institution is all powerful. Those who are subject to the institution are powerless, are being docile, are being reformed. And so he really loses his capacity to identify ways for an underlife to push back against this. Page 156. So the disciplines then organize uh, on a massive scale and, uh, and a micro scale. So they both are a macro organization, a micro organization. Uh, it's kind of a machine reconstruction of human activity, um, all pre-planned, everything is pre-programmed, uh, predetermined, um, and pre-mapped, right? So segmentation, seriation, uh, uh, syntheses, to totalization, and all of this is done to maximize the organization's power and capitalism. That means profit again, something that he understates, but it is there, right? That all of this is done, you know, Marx's talk uh, is used here at moments to maximize profit, right? To generate a surplus and a maximum surplus is then uh, appropriated by the owner or to create maximum military power that's then appropriated by the general and, and so on. Okay, page 161, this is where you begin to talk about exercise as a technique, right? So if you exercise, uh, you're doing repetitive things, and then you're graduating your, um, uh, your complexity or graduating the difficulty, right? 
uh, and then you're, but, but again, but you're constantly economizing. So it creates a grid of life and it helps you redeem time. So it's this constant exercise of capabilities. You build capabilities, you build essentially muscle and, and, um, and that, and that, that helps you then redeem uh, maximum amount of time. Page 162, when you combine work through a division of labor and then a recombination and you synthesis, the combination of forces produces a surplus. Um, yeah, that a surplus power, surplus profit. Uh, so the disciplines maximizes that surplus. And then as Marx says in capital, it gets appropriated. Um, the socialization of labor is appropriate, creates a huge surplus that is then appropriated by capital as its product, right? Okay, but power, any kind of power. So anytime you get humans aggregated and you expose them to this kind of discipline and then the composition of all of the forces under that discipline generates a massive surplus that then is appropriated by whatever power is extracting uh, the human labor and controlling it. Page 164, disciplines are uh, construct social machine then of optimal efficiency. The body is reduced to a cog in a large social machine. It's chronologically and uh, temporally disciplined, coordinated for maximum effects. Uh, there's a command and authority and domination structure that's necessary to coordinate and control, hence the need for docility, obedience, right? Automatic response to command. Uh, I am indicating on page 166, there's something that I should quote there. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Dressage. Yeah. That idea, you know, the horses that do the little dressage. It's a more generalized idea, you know, where you're doing this minute, um, fussy movement, right? And showing that you can do this. It's a more generalized concept um, that despotically excludes in everything the least representation, the smallest murmur. The disciplined soldier begins to obey whatever he is ordered to do. The obedience prompt and blind appearance of indocility, the least delay would be a crime. So just like the horse in 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 uh, equestrian dressage, right? The thing that Mitt Romney was interested in, right? Where again, where you move fussy little horses in fussy little ways, you're just sort of proving that you have complete dominance over the horse, right? That that concept is broad and applies in the military, where the good soldier doesn't resist, doesn't talk back, doesn't think, just does, executes. Robert Miner's perfect soldier. So blind obedience and automatic response as the ideal. Okay, um, see the sum on page 167. Discipline is cellular. Uh, see timetables. It's organic, prescribes movement. It's genetic. Uh, see exercises, and it's combinatory. See um, um, something about tactics. I can't read what it is. We'll move on. Page 168 to 169, the military model, again, then, especially the Prussian soldierly male, all training, no liberation, no civil society. So this is important. I just want to back up and say this is one of those places where, where Foucault aligns with many of the other thinkers that are um, alive in my uh, graduate social theory courses. This is a challenge to democracy. It's a challenge to enlightenment autonomy. It's a challenge to individual uh, uh, self-management and self-direction, to freedom in any way meaningful. That disciplined society makes free movement uh, um, almost, uh, you know, in illegality or a technical um, um, infraction. And it, this is a real problem for a free society. So how do you unite uh, freedom with a world that has been reduced to something like military uh, uh, um, uh, um, organization and coordination? All right. Uh, the next chapter is the means of correct training, where he talks about strict discipline, I won't spend a lot of time here. It's very readable. Um, so like page 170 talks about, okay, these are the big principles, the means of correct training. How does strict discipline op operate? Number one, hierarchical observation. Number two, normalizing judgment. And then number three, examinations. Okay, so we'll walk through those uh, in, in turn. So first, hierarchical observation. So the military camp is an ideal here. Um, um, Observatories are laid out. Uh, superiors maintain constant visual access to subordinates. The gaze is constant. Um, see also, you know, working class housing, he says, housing estates that are organized so that it's easy for police and for authorities to monitor them. 
so to any prison, so to any school. Schools are laid out so that it's very easy for principals and police officers or teachers to basically survey uh, or um, uh, you know supervise, uh, oversee their students uh, or, or their inmates. Uh, quote on page 172, there's a, so a new architecture of surveillance is perfected in the modern time, but the prison is the ideal form of that. But again, every factory, every school, every military barracks, every hospital has that same structure. That's why they all look alike. There's perfect disciplinary apparatus. It, oh yeah, it would make it possible for a single gaze to see everything constantly. Okay, so in arc, so you know you, you so the new architecture of surveillance reduces the labor of supervision to a minimum while increasing its power to a maximum. You want to render all subordinates perfectly visible at all times, and 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 with 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 the least amount of labor necessary. So page one seventy five surveillance then supervision overseeing becomes part of of capital itself. Marx is quoted here. Um, page 177, discipline, uh, the spectacle of public events, um, substitutes the uninterrupted play of, of calculated gazes. New power relation. I can't quite remember what that's referring to. The spectacle of public events subs substitutes. I can't I can't recall what that is talking about. Um, so I guess we better look page 177. You know it's bad when your own notes don't help much, right? Um, uh, uh, relational power that sustains up by its own mechanism. Oh, obviously, geez, why is that so hard? Of course. So instead of the spectacle of public events, the scaffold with the abuse and, and dismemberment of a condemned person, you get rid of that and you use discipline instead, which is the uninterrupted play of calculated gazes, right? So instead of power being seen, you have power seeing, an uninterrupted, uninterrupted play of calculated gazes. That's power now. So power resides in seeing instead of being seen. Having power being subjected to power in the past was seeing it, and now it's being seen by it. Okay, number two, the normalizing judgment. Okay, there's a micro elaboration of rules and penalties for infraction. Uh, and then I, I, I renumber them here. I think they're one through five, but anyway. A, uh, slightest departure from correct behavior is punished. Uh, micro penalties. So if you've ever been in a marching band uh, or ever been arrayed in a, a physical uh, line where you're a marching band is really good at this. A military parade is really good at this. Um, inspection parades are good at this, like in POW camps, um, where you're placed in a grid, and the grid allows for any infraction to stand out. So if everyone is uniform, any infraction jumps out, right? So this is the idea. The slightest departure from correct behavior is punished. Micro penalties. That's one of the reasons why uniformity in uniforms and so on is so widespread. B, the failure to meet a standard is itself punished, uh, graduated uh, capability. Yeah, so if you're in a group and you can't quite even meet the standard of the group, even if you want to, you're either held back again or placed in a different group so that only those graduate who have proven the capability to do it. It's part of the individuation here. It isn't that the system individuates you. It actually locks you into a grid where it places you in the position in the grid that you are individually um supposed to be in, right? All right, C, disciplinary punishment is corrective. It's an exercise, all right? So that's what the goal is, correcting, not punishing, not vengeance, but correcting, right? So it's coercing the body and disciplining the body so that it becomes the thing that the disciplinary agency wants it to become. It's not about reforming the soul, and it isn't about wreaking vengeance. It's about correcting. So discipline um, also includes justification and um, and um, and oh yeah, and records, uh, uh, points keeping, and so on. Uh, discipline ranks, um, uh, punishes, um, measures, uh, records, grades, generates a massive knowledge of the subject. Yeah. So the power knowledge nexus is really emphasized here, right? 
that it is knowledge of the subject, the normalizing judgment of the teacher who keeps records, of the principal who keeps records, of the military commander who keeps records, of the factory a manager who keeps, or personnel department that keeps records, right? That that normalizing judgment then is classifying and grading the subject. It isn't that you're known in your qualitative distinctiveness, it's you're known in accordance to the grid of discipline, right? Okay, but that knowledge of the subject is then used to control the subject because the knowledge that's possessed of you determines your fate and determines how power interacts with you. So knowledge is power, power operates through knowledge. The summary on page 182 then, um, so disciplinary society compares, differentiates, hierarchizes, uh, creates hierarchies, uh, homogenizes, and excludes, right? That that's how normalization operates, comparing, differentiating, creating hierarchies, homogenizing, and uh, excluding. So page 183 then, uh, disciplinary mechanisms are not juridical. They're separated from the court system and from uh, uh, the agents of the law. So again, once you get inside the prison, you're subject to prison authority. Once you get inside schools, school authority. Uh, once inside of a worker uh, workplace or a factory, it's workplace supervisor supervisory authority and that is distinct from not completely but largely autonomous uh, from the juridical system there's a distinctive logic and he claims it's the power of the norm instead of the power of the law all right then he writes about examinations there's a good section on that so examinations are everywhere in disciplinary institutions are everywhere in modern society they combine the hierarchical gaze and the normalizing judgment in one and examinations are what generate the documents that wind up in your file. So when you're examined, when you go in, you examine when you come out, you're examined at points when you could proceed. So whenever you're moved from one classification to another or one point in the grid to another, it's often because of the results of an examination. So examinations then transform visibility into power in discipline. It is the subjects who are seen. All right. Two. Examinations are the bases of records, files, case records that know the subject and creates all um, important files that determines their fate. So knowledge is power, knowledge, right? Power is power, knowledge, knowledge is power, knowledge. Three, it reduces individuals to a case to be the object of disciplinary writing it is to be subject to, um, yeah, to coercion and control. So again, compare this to Braverman, uh, in Monop his labor monopoly capital compared to Vitmax labor and bureaucracy, um, you know, um, this is this is what happens when you reduce to a case, right? Um, okay, and then see page one ninety two to one ninety three. Traditional power, uh, um, you become more individuated the higher you go in the system, right? It is the aristocracy that takes on the sort of markers of individuality, and with the king being the ultimate in ultimate individual in the society. They're the ones who are seen. They're the ones who are known. Um, you know, we know everything there's about them. We all have images of them. They're on our coins and everything else. So in traditional society, the higher you are in the hierarchy, the more power you have, the more individuated you are, and the more visible that individuation is uh, to the populace. Being seen is what it was to be powerful. In disciplinary society, power um, is invisible, and that means individuation descends. The lower you are in the system, the more you are perpetually subjected to um, the hierarchizing gaze, the, hi the hierarch, the 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 um, hierarch. God, why can't I say it? Jeez, the hierarchical observation, the normalizing judgment, the examination. Right, you can't escape it, and that determines your fate. The higher you are in the system, even having sufficient capital, a trust fund, to put your middle finger up to, um, to, uh, um, to a system, to a boss, um, to, a, um, to a professor, as far as that goes, right? If you have enough capital to fall back on, you don't have to play along. And that means you're higher in the system and you're not quite as subject to the examination or subject to the gaze. Right, but hierarchical observation, normalizing judgment, examinations determine the fate of those at the bottom. And the higher you go, the more you possess power, the more you possess um, capital, the less the disciplinary gaze falls upon you, the less deter uh, individuated you are. So we know, for example, that Google uh, collects tons of data on us. We know that many websites do. We know that uh, that um, 
you know, Amazon does. We know that we know that uh, we are known incredibly accurately through uh, through the glowing screens and through social media and through you know what's what used to be called metadata. I don't even know still call that anymore, right? The kind of um, uh, you know the cookies and the background data that is uh, that that marks us in our digital double. That when we are doubled in the digital world and go through our acts, uh, we are being traced and and uh, there's a file created upon us, right? And that the in that that the higher you are in that system, right, the more you know about the individuated preferences of a massive number of people. That's how Google makes money, right? It pushes ads to those uh, uh, to, to those uh, at the bottom who are fully known. We know we, th- th- those at the bottom who are using Google services are known, right? Or using YouTube are known. And then you get products pushed to you based upon that knowledge. You get political uh, propaganda sent to you based upon that knowledge and so on, right? So, so there's a descending individuation. The lower you are in the system, the more the system exposes you to the perpetual hierarchical observation, normalizing judgment and examinations that determine your fate. The higher you are, the more you're in possession of the agencies of power that can use that data as power, that knowledge as power, right? And then you're, again, you are the objects, uh, you are the subjects that utilize power and the subjects that are utilized by power, right? Okay. So I think that ends that section. We'll come back for one more uh, uh, recording on panopticism and on the carceral, and then we'll end the book. I hope you found this useful.